welcome to part two of our absolutely spellbinding Whiskeymentary on Sourcing on the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. And I am Ed. In part one, we covered what sourcing is and its long, transformative history in the whiskey industry. But today, we'll be focusing on the biggest player on the modern whiskey sourcing stage, a company we've been praising since our very first episode, MGP. We'll also be discussing why sourcing in general has garnered a bit of a bad reputation and then tasting a new whiskey that's actually not really that new, which used to be sourced, but is no longer sourced, and yet it didn't change at all. (laughs) Confused? Well, that's the whiskey sourcing business for you. But Ed's going to get us started by telling us how MGP came to be. Thanks, Scott. And first of all, I'd like to let everyone know that we're drinking a special single barrel pick of Redemption High Rye Bourbon. Yes. Which is sourced from MGP. And it's delicious. And it's delicious. It's 105 proof. (laughs) Redemption's really stepped up their game from our first episode, which where we featured them. This is actually their bourbon, though. This is their high rye bourbon. Right. So before I give you the history of MGP, I thought it'd be interesting to read their mission statement here. Okay. To create and build a portfolio of super premium priced and positioned spirit brands for consumers and the trade, leveraging MGP's vast distilling capabilities and blending expertise, ensuring that these brands meet or exceed both the consumers and the customers' expectations for taste, style, and quality. Mm, very nice. And I have to tell you, I think they meet that because I have never mm. bumped into a bad MGP product. No, I mean, like I said in the intro, we've been talking to these guys up since the very beginning when we first found out about MGP being the source of a lot of our favorite whiskeys. And we're basically of the opinion that if it tastes good, who really cares who made it originally? Right. I drank so much of what they made and never realized quite what was going on. But like Scott said, we profiled MGP on our very first podcast episode when we did Bullet Rye vs. Redemption Rye. And we've had nothing but positive things to say about MGP. The people who get in trouble with MGP is not MGP. All right. It's people that just simply don't want to be transparent to their consumers and scott's got something to say about that right so mgp doesn't talk much about which brands they have a hand in but it doesn't take much detective work to figure it out and it's not that they're embarrassed it's like they're respecting the privacy of their clients Mm -hmm. mgp just provides a service you get a four-year rye whiskey from them do with it as you'd like Mm. but we know that some of the major ones angel envy rye bullet rye high west redemption whistle pig 12 year i believe then we can go on there's over 50 (laughs) <laughs> and MGP produces different mash bills and different types of whiskey, some exclusively for certain clients, others opting to blend their own combinations or further finish their whiskey that they receive in different barrels like right. Angel Envy does in the, in the rum cast. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, Barrel does a lot of finishing of their own, but not just from right. MGP, but then they just make these incredible blended expressions. <laughs> that is so true. So MGP, aka MGPI or MGP of Indiana, is the largest contract distiller in the United States. So contract distilling is when a spirits distillery contracts with a third-party brand to provide them distilled spirits. The distillery may sell that brand a fully-aged whiskey, or it might distill a specific what they call a white dog, the raw spirit, if you will, right. that the brand will age themselves. Not raw dog. Right, not raw dog, <laughs> but white dog. On the other side of the equation is the NDP. This is the company buying the whiskey from the distiller. Mm-hmm. They focus their efforts on finishing, blending, and crafting the brand's story, always important, and the marketing. Often a startup brand will begin purchasing whiskey from a distiller while building their own distillery. This is what we've seen uh, many people do. If a bottle label reads distilled Indiana, it was almost certainly distilled by MGP. Right. They distill most of the rye whiskey uh, on the U.S. market and a ton of bourbon. They aren't the only players, though. In 2016, Bardstown Bourbon Company opened its contract distilling business in Bardstown, Kentucky, with an annual distillation capacity of about 1.5 million gallons. And in June of 2017, Mm -hmm. that number went up to roughly 6 million gallons, which I believe is their capacity. Mm. They have an awesome visitor's facility and have kind of gotten to that whole, you know, bourbon trail thing down in Kentucky. Right, right. So Bardstown, they're involved in producing some of the most notable whiskeys as well. And some of them overlap with what MGP provides. Okay. Jefferson, High West, Bell Mead, Hirsch. Right, so they're sourcing from both of them. Calumet, right, James E. Pepper, Cyrus Noble. So maybe this is where the, the terrible bourbon comes from for James E. Pepper. Oh, damn. I would have been blaming on a rare miss for MGP, but here the whole time it might not be their problem at all. <laughs> no, they're much maligned. So the history of MGP. The growing 
bourbon and whiskey trend in the United States has experienced a renaissance, like Scott and I have said many times. The major Kentucky distilleries have embraced this and spent millions of dollars improving their facilities with tours and fine-tuning their colorful backstories of their frontier adventure and historical glory of their products. They're now the destination of tourists as well as whiskey purists. Oh, I see. That nice uh, rhyming. <laughs> MGP Distillery is not open to the public. Uh, they don't offer tours on a regular basis, have a gift shop, or do tastings. Mm. But once or twice a year, evidently, they extend invitations to certain media on Media Day at their Lawrenceburg Distillery in Indiana. This is an opportunity for people who cover the whiskey business to get like a glimpse behind the curtain, if you will. Now, I've never had the tour myself, Scott, and I know you haven't either. No. I, Maybe someday. In our role as media professionals. Whatever. <laughs> and we're already, I mean, we're, we're already so friendly with them now. <laughs> right. uh, we've had such a great time speaking with them in the production of this Wiscumentary, which you'll hear later. So two people who have different blog posts, William Regal and Kelly Nakagama, have been on the Media Day tours. And so they shared a lot of what they saw. Okay. And I thought it was very interesting to share some of that. So I'm going to be, you know, referring to some of their observations, if you will. Okay. But first, the history of MGP's Lawrenceburg Distillery officially dates back to 1847, but there's record on site that go back to 1809. But officially, George Ross opened the Rossville Distillery in 1847. He picked the Indiana spot because the underground aquifer that produces a limestone filtered water is so vast, giving his rye whiskey a pure, unique taste. It soon became known as one of the best rye whiskeys available, mm. and still is, crazy as it is. Mm. 100 and what? 80 years later? Right. So once again, he picked Indiana spot for the limestone. Mm -hmm. So why all the hype with limestone? Well, First, the limestone filters out iron and sulfur, two things that hurt the flavor of water-made products. Yeah. Second, it has a high pH level that aids in the fermentation process. Mm. So bottom line is great water equals great whiskey. Right. And we talked about that with Crown Royal. Their position on the shores of Lake Winnipeg on top of a giant limestone deposit. Right. So, so Indiana has this right. and Kentucky, of course, we know has it too. Right. So when American taste for whiskey declined after Prohibition, Seagram's bought the Rossville Distillery in 1933 so right after <clears throat> prohibition right after a few more owners each with respective name changes mgp bought the distillery in 2011 but it's important to note that a lot of the things that have been in place have not changed right it changed hands it changed companies but the distillery and the surrounding grounds stayed the same there are people who have been involved in the whiskey making process there for four even five decades right today mgp distillery produces whiskey vodka gin and neutral grain spirits, and industrial alcohol. Mm. Unlike the wooded Kentucky rickhouses, the ones that Seagram's put in were made of brick. The design allowed for aging whiskey more uniformly, keeping the temperature regulated, and possibly for <laughs> preventing those inevitable distillery fires. <laughs> right. They brought the world the first successful whiskey. Many of you remember your aunts and your moms sitting around drinking Seagram's Seven mm. Crown Whiskey. Now, if you find anything resembling Seagram's Seven today, it is garbage. <laughs> it's made by Diageo up in Connecticut with 75% vodka, basically neutral grain spirits in it. Mm -hmm. Avoid it like the plague. It's like $12. <laughs> if you're homeless and sad and you need to get drunk, then maybe. Yeah. So maybe you, you might mention this, but um, when is that switchover? So when did Seagram's become bad? Right. I'll take you on that. So okay. in the 70s, Seagram's was a mix of four mash bills, which are supposedly still in use by MGP. Okay. And it was the first whiskey to ever sell a million cases in its career. Like, wow. Wow. And then it reached 100 million cases by probably like the mid to late 70s and maxed out at 300 million cases sold by 1983. Hmm. So it was a really kick-ass whiskey, mm -hmm. you know? The Secret 7 brand was sold off to Diageo in 2000 and is now made in Connecticut. Like I said, it's mash bills, nothing like the original. Mm. When did it start to go down? I'm assuming once it left that location. So maybe Secret 7 was still a decent whiskey. In the late 80s? Well, you know, even in 2000, maybe. Okay. So, so the reason I'm asking is because yeah. I drank a lot of it in college. Yeah. So that's like late 80s. I mean, it was probably my first whiskey that I'd ever had. Yeah. I, mean, I kind of liked it. I just drank it in, you know, with ginger too. ale. Yeah. Yeah. I used to drink it even like out of the bottle sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would steal it from my aunt's house. You know, I was a terrible child sometimes, I guess, but <laughs> just grab it out of the cabinet and just gun it real quick. And I mean, I had no palate, but I certainly remember it being flavorful. 
I, I guess that might be a nice quest for us to go in and try to find a, a, a garage sale from back then. A garage sale bottle of Seagram Seven. I'm, there has to be with the three hundred million cases that were moved. Could be a whiskey wormhole. If episode. anybody has <laughs> an old bottle of Seagram Seven that you think is from pre eighty five, let's say, we'd love to taste that with you. Search your parents' dusty old liquor right, cabinets. Exactly. So, Scott, there has been a lot of controversy involving sourcing, and I think we're coming out of it. I think it's past the worst of it, if you will, as far as once people realize it was that widespread. I think it's like, you know, with steroids in baseball, you first hear like, oh, Caseco and Sosa are doing it. It's a travesty. Then you, oh, no, it's a uh, McGuire. Brady Anderson and McGuire are doing it. It's a travesty. Well, wait, the pitchers are doing it, too. Clemens is doing it, too. Well, if everyone's on steroids. Right, then it evens the playing field. <laughs> Even Mike Schmidt said we were all on amphetamines in the 70s. Why do you think I could... <laughs> You could think I could, maybe I wouldn't hit so many home runs if I wasn't speeding. So it's kind of like that with, with sourcing. Like once people realize that so many of the whiskeys are now part of that. Even though George Dickel will source their own bourbon to someone else, they source their rye from MGP because you know why? It's good goddamn rye. Yeah. And they have plenty of it, as you said. Gabriel. Games arrived. He's here for the He's after for podcast f- uh, festivities. We uh, haven't really had our uh, Christmas or New Year celebration with Gabe yet. Yeah, we haven't seen him in a while since like Halloween. I think it was. Let's see what Gabe's brought us, everybody. Are you live? Yeah, we're yeah we're, we're live recording. right now recording. Oh, oh, the Hirsch, the Hirsch, which nice. which ironically is sourced from MGP. Is it? What sourcing? <laughs> you already listened to part one, you bastard. Random belligerents. Gabe's a bastard edition. No, I take that back. It's not sourced from MGP. Oh. It's rated very highly by Whiskey Tangent. Wait. Uh, whiskey, uh, whiskey. Uh, uh, maybe by us. <laughs> maybe by Whiskey Tangent after we taste we it. We don't know yet. <laughs> We don't know. <laughs> Wait for it. Oh, I think this is the Bardstown Bourbon Company. Oh, is it? This is one that they source. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the, the bad rep. I mentioned it a little bit in part one. This is a bad rep. Undeserved. Sometime in the mid-20-teens, whiskey consumers started to become aware that some of their favorite brands were not actually produced by who they thought. And MGP was revealed to be the source of most of these whiskeys. Almost immediately and undeservedly, they were deemed to be the bad guy in this sourcing controversy. But like we talked about last week in part one, sourcing is really nothing new, nor is it necessarily controversial. But I offered up two reasons for the bad reputation that it sometimes receives. The first reason was that unscrupulous wholesalers and retailers were adding to or watering down whiskeys, or perhaps worse, pawning off lower priced whiskeys for higher priced ones. The whiskey industry has since addressed this problem, with various regulations like the Bottled and Bond Act and others that detail exactly who and how whiskey can be bottled and sold, and levying harsh penalties for those who don't comply. The second reason was what I termed, quote, a seeming lack of transparency to the uninformed. And this problem is one that still hasn't quite been fully addressed, and we've discussed many times on this podcast, even before this whiskey menary, Ed and I both think sourcing is fine. Like we said, it's a great way for new companies to get off the ground, and with all the different types of whiskeys available, you have a really good shot at making something unique that you can market and sell and be successful with. However, as a consumer, you might want to know what it is that you're actually buying, without having to do a ton of research on the brand beforehand, its history, the mash bills, etc. I mean, having done a podcast on whiskey for about two years now, I can tell you that although it can be intensely interesting, sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get accurate, truthful information about a particular brand, because each source you look up seems to know only part of the story. So, what are some brands not telling you? Just to name a few examples, we talked before about Templeton Rye, who sources from MTP, and in 2015 settled a class action lawsuit for $2.5 million, agreeing to feature the words distilled in Indiana on the back of their bottles and remove the words small batch and prohibition era recipe from the front after consumers sued them for deceptive marketing. We also talked about Widow Jane, a Brooklyn-based company who in 2018 were forced to change their label from stating Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, Pure Limestone Water from the Widow Jane Mine, to Blend of Straight Bourbons, Pure Limestone Water from the Legendary Rosedale Mines of New York, in order to clarify that they weren't sourcing solely from Kentucky and did not, in fact, use water from the Widow Jane Mine itself, but from a different source close by. Mm. And it's not just whiskey. Tito's Handmade Vodka has been sued numerous times over the word handmade, Mm. because Tito's is actually created in a large, mostly automated industrial facility. You don't need that. Just say say Tito's badass delivery. Delicious fucking vodka. Let's just say that. Right. But there's one popular whiskey that we've never really talked about in this context at all, Mm. and that's Bullet. Now, we all know the rye, which was released in 2011, is sourced from one of MGP's 95 rye, 5% malted barley recipes, and the Bullet Company isn't particularly shy about admitting that. However, where their bourbon comes from is a bit less straightforward. 
I'm going to save the full story of Bullet Bourbon from an upcoming podcast, but suffice it to say that Seagram's acquired the brand in 1997, distilling spirits for it in their Lawrenceburg, Kentucky distillery, mm -hmm. different from the Lawrenceburg, Indiana distillery. Right. When Diageo acquired Seagram's assets in 2000, it included Bullet and the distillery, so distilling remained at the same place. Mm -hmm. But in 2002, Diageo sold this distillery to the Japanese company Kirin, but retained the Bullet brand and continued to source Bullet bourbon from that distillery until about 2015. In March 2017, Diageo built a dedicated bullet distillery of their own in Shelbyville, Kentucky, but we just entered 2021. And because bourbons with no age statement have to be at least four years old, it hasn't quite been long enough for them to start bottling their own aged distillate. So, between 2015 and today, a gap of six years, where the hell was all that bullet bourbon coming from? Unfortunately, they're not saying. But Bullet does admit that the mash bill is 68% corn, 28% rye, and 4% malted barley. And the bottle does say Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. So, there are only so many Kentucky distillers with the capacity to produce as much bourbon as Bullet needs. And those distilleries are Beam Centauri, Barton's, and Heaven Hill. Interesting. But they're not talking either. Right. So, we may never know the truth. And with Bullet set to be bottling their own stuff soon, maybe the point is moot now. But, for me, there are two larger questions that remain. Why does it have to be so damn opaque? Right. And what can we do about it? The answer to the first one, I suspect, is that it's probably just a layer of good old traditional Southern gentlemen's agreements, a coating of run-of-the-mill corporate secrecy, and a veneer of cagey marketing, all in the service of creating a facade of origin stories that are steeped in history. However, to me, what is clear is that MGP and the others who are the source of these whiskeys aren't to blame for any of this. Simply put, they sold a product made in good faith to other companies, and then some of those other companies did something shady with it. And the answer to the second question, what's the solution to all this lack of transparency? Well, for that, you'll have to tune in to part three. <laughs> and I, I think what I've said many times is for people who feel cheated because MGP isn't the story that your particular favorite bourbon or rye sold you, right. MGP has enough history going back to 1809. If you need that history to get your rocks off while you're drinking your whiskey on the rocks. So... <laughs> Going through the tour observations of Kelly Nakagama and uh, William Regal, what she said was she knew they were the largest producer of rye whiskey in the country, but that to see the size of the of the campus of MGP was overwhelming at times. To see like a sea of fermenters, the number of gallons in each was hard to comprehend, but it was outright mind-blowing. And then to realize that it was only one fermentation room. William Regal, speaking of the same stuff on his tour, said that he was in all of those buildings as well. It was like sweet smell of cornbread hit his nose as he looked in all at 14, 27,814 gallon fermentation. Tanks, oh. nearly all filled to the brim 14 14 of them in the same room wow how large that must i be. know how big that room I mean, is you're talking about over three hundred thousand gallons of fermenting spirit in one room and it's not the only room they have wow and they have the still that they use in indiana from 1942 they have a gin producing still in kansas from 1941 still in use still the still is still, still in use still stilling still stilling <laughs> still squared <laughs> So it's pretty pretty interesting, and we have a, a wonderful interview that will be part of this. Justin King, he's, yeah. he's a, a rep from MGP. Who's in charge of Southeastern Craft Beverage Sales. Yes, and uh, we did an interview with him about all this, how it all works, and so we'll just go to that right now. So hey, Justin, uh, how much time we got with you today? You have time to hang out a bit, or you want a tight schedule? Uh, I'm pretty open. Um, okay, great. That's what we love to hear. <laughs> chat as long as you want i'm kind of just hanging out today we appreciate you coming on uh each year we do like a little documentary we call it a whiskey mentory last year was on prohibition because it was the 100 year anniversary of prohibition and sourcing is something that's been fascinating to us since we started this a couple years ago but i want to start out with you just give us your background basically what you actually do at mgp i think that'd be great back in 2009 tennessee allowed more distilleries to be built so joe baker opened up Old Smoky Moonshine as a business. And I was brought on board to distill their product and really do product development and, and run the business on the distilling side. I did that from late 2009, early 2010, until I think I came on to MGP in April of 2017. It was really a craft alcohol salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, back then, you know, MGP really didn't sell to, to smaller craft distilleries. You know, they, they had big minimums and large custom runs and they just didn't really you know, work in that world. So me coming from that small craft distillery and having all that experience, you know, I was able to do things like we now put four barrels on a pallet or we'll sell them totes of bourbon distillate. 
Or, you know, we come up with a great gin program where we have seven gins and the customer can mix match over proprietary blend and we'll put it in a tote and send it to you. So it's been a fun 10 years for me, for sure. I mean, um, coming on at MGP, you know, I got to travel all across the country. I've seen hundreds of distilleries and you, know, you get to kind of taste and see what everybody's doing. Right. And I, I guess that's the next question I have. Do you handle like bullet and redemption or are you scrambling around for smaller distillery or something like that? Or even like the individual bars and stores that put out their own barrels is who do you tend to spend your time with? Honestly, everybody. At first, you know, I was only trying to do smaller crafts, but what that turned into was these customers would start growing. You know, they would go from buying four barrels to to 20 barrels to 50 barrels. And so now I've got a whole mix of customers from from very large to, you know, very small. And what MGP has done is we've, we've actually given sales territories now. So like I have the Southeast, for instance, but I still have customers in California and Oregon and Maine. It's just people that I had relationships with that we keep. Because like in this business, relationship is everything. So Justin, what's the process that someone would go through to source whiskey from you? Like, how do they reach out? You know, we have a great website that we've put together. You can go on the website. You can request samples. You can request, you know, have somebody call you. And depending on what territory you're in, we're going to call the customer and try to figure out what their needs are, how we can help them. The website's everything right now with COVID and everything going on. Um, I direct everybody there. It has our mash bills on it. It has what we do on it. But yeah, anybody can contact us and we'll reach out and see if we can help them. Right. So what services do you provide? We do new product development. You know, if a customer comes to us and wants a a blended bourbon or custom gin, um, if you want a custom mash bill, we can do that too. Anything that's grain based. Scoping a customer's plan too. You know, if they need a brand in four years, we can sell them new fill barrels now. We can store the barrels for them. And when four years comes, they can put the product out. So there's there's many ways MGP can help a new startup to a, an existing brand. All right, so that brings me to a question that I've really always had. How are you able to produce enough whiskey to keep so many people happy? How do you create such a nice steady supply of aged spirit? It's some type of whiskey magic. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the facility that's that's making the whiskey there in Lawrenceburg is, is quite large. We do have plenty of stocks of whiskey. I don't see us running out anytime soon. You know, and we're able to take on new customers every day. We've looked into the industry. We think we know what the industry is going to do. And we're, we're here to provide them whiskey and bourbon. So do you often lose customers? Like uh, a lot of people say that they source originally and then they go and distill their own stuff after that. How often do you lose people? It does happen. And the way that I feel about that is more power to them. I'm a distiller by trade. So mm-hmm. I mean, I understand sourcing your product and then getting into your own. I would love to talk more about certain brands that have done that. But MGP, we really don't talk about other brands. Right. I got you. But it, it does happen. And that's just that's part of the business. Right. And right. we know four years from now, we're probably not going to have them as a customer, but that's four years from now. I mean, you, you, right. you do the work and you get them the barrels and the juice they need. Right. Now, even around us, we have a liquor store near us that has put out the weeder that comes from your 95.5 wheat mash bill. They put out a cast strength of your 95.5 rye, the same liquor store. Delicious whiskeys. I mean, some of the favorite whiskeys I've ever had. And it got Scott and I thinking, how many whiskeys are going on around the country that we'll never try? You know, the teeth that are being created through MGP and your website in Des Moines, Iowa or Santa Barbara, that's, California. That's the fun part of it is, you know, we have stuff going everywhere every day. And uh, that's the exciting fun part is the bottle hunt to find some of those bottles. It all happens. You know, come, a lot of people come to the website and then it moves right on to the liquor store. Okay, how many match bills do you guys actually have without creating anything new? It's a really good question because it's 20 plus. Are these historical match bills inherited that have carried through at that location? To my understanding, yes. We do have quite a bit of historical match bills there. Yeast strain is, is the same also. I'm not exactly sure how many total that they're running, but I know it's, it's five plus. So how are the different yeast strains um, used to affect the flavor of the whiskey? It's different yeast work different with different grains. Um, you definitely have taste differences mm-hmm. from strain to strain. Four Roses is really big on, they run two different you know, yeast strains, and you can definitely taste the difference. It plays a big role. It really does. That's another part of something MGP can do is if the owner wanted a certain strain, we'll run that with their product. And that might answer the question of how so many products can use the same mash bills and taste so different. Yeast does play a big factor in that. 
there's so many factors. Yeast is something that, especially as a consumer, you probably don't even know. People might not even realize that there's yeast involved. <laughs> yeah, yeast is kind of the workhorse to the whole process. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes the alcohol in the first place. Yeah. So take us through a procedure real quick before we let you go. What would happen if Scott and I wanted, all right, we're going to put out our own whiskey tangent bourbon. Right. We'll put one of each out, Scott. All right, fine. All right, <laughs> fine. So we're looking to put out maybe, I don't know, a thousand bottles of each. We got the capital. We got a place to bottle it. But of course, we don't have any corn or rye. So how does that work? We're on the website. Take us through the procedure of how that would work. Go to the website, do a request, maybe a sample request for what you're looking for or what you think you're looking for. One of us will call you, email you, get in contact with you. Um, We'll get you samples. We'll get you pricing. And then from there, it's just do a customer setup. You purchase the barrels and have them shipped to your bottler. It's quite simple. And something a lot of people don't know, too, is you can actually buy barrels and store them with us. You can't take them anywhere until you have a transfer and bond. We charge roughly $2 per barrel per month. Wow. That's a, see, that's a great service that I never knew you guys would do. Like, that's yeah. really interesting. Okay. Last question for you, Justin. What's the one thing you'd like people to know about NGP? Simply, we'll sell to anybody. Mm-hmm. Just, like I said, hit the website up. Hopefully, we can get a brand going. Super easy to work with. You know, I think between the seven salespeople, we were joking the other day, we have like 210 years of knowledge. <laughs> We've all been in the industry quite a while. I think I'm the youngest by far. Well, I don't have anything for, add anything more for him, for Justin. No. I had a question I was going to ask you guys, and that's like, what could we put in a bottle for you? But we've already went over that. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I mean, I've had a lot of good experience with you. 95 wheat, 5% malted barley. I, I probably would lean that way. But Scott, I would probably want to be up at the 95.5 rye. I go 100% rye. Give me, give me all rye. Just give it all to me. He doesn't care if it ferments at all. Just put, <laughs> put stalks of rye in a bottle and send it to him. We have 100% rye. Do you? Yeah, we're using rye malt to make the conversion. Right, right. Uh, love it. Well, I hope this isn't the last time we talk. We'll have to catch up again down the road. I want to thank you for coming on with Scott and I in the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, love what you guys are doing. I've listened to your stuff in, in the past. Oh, you have? Really? Oh, you know, traveling and such. You know, I listen to bourbon podcasts a lot. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, awesome, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, give me a call. Keep listening and hit us up on our Whiskey Tangent Gmail if you have anything to say or comments. And maybe one day we'll do a barrel down the road. Awesome. Well, thank yeah. you, guys. Be Thanks, well. Justin. So besides their extensive contracting of you know distillation products, they have made their own ventures into the whiskey business. Right, their own brands. Right, you mean. their own yeah, brands. Yeah. yeah, and we have one of them here. Yeah. So this is the whiskey I mentioned in the intro. It is George Remus, and if you listen to last year's Prohibition whiskey memory, you know exactly who George Remus is. Uh, but if you didn't listen, then shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you didn't listen or forgot, here's a refresher. If you're talking about bootleggers, though, George Remus from Chicago is my favorite, and here's why. He was a 20-year defense attorney. He's a very smart guy. When Prohibition hits, the whole loophole that he saw was that drug companies were going to be able to sell whiskey medicinally. So he is a pioneer of vertical integration. He called it the circle. And what the circle was, all those distilleries that couldn't sell had rickhouses full of whiskey. And so he went down the line and bought as many as he could. And he moved his operation to Cincinnati, Ohio. And within the 250-mile radius, he had about 80% of the distilled barreled whiskey in America at his disposal. And his goal was to buy as much as possible and ship it to Cincinnati. And then when in Cincinnati, he formed a drug company that got a license to sell it legally. And he formed a trucking company to move it. And that's how the circle worked. And over the time of Prohibition, George Remus made $75 million bootlegging. And he's the king of it. And so his model has been used many times over by other companies. See Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) You order something Amazon, the truck shows up, it's got Amazon on it. The box is Amazon. It's in their warehouse. Yeah. And then you look around like they're actually putting it into your cabinet. They're like putting it away for you. you, Who are you? I'm from Amazon. I'm just putting it away in your pantry. (laughs) So the whiskey, George Remus, it started out as a brand created by Queen City Whiskey in Cincinnati, Ohio by three guys, Chad Brizendine, Nate Lawton, and J.B. Crop. They had a bourbon, a rye, and a limited release rye, all of which were sourced from MGP. And they were sold only in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. 
In 2017, they sold it to MGP, which made George Remus their flagship brand. Mm. Just from MGP's website, georgeremus.com. Some rules are made to be broken. Prohibition, for example. <laughs> <laughs> saying George Remus was just a bootlegger is like saying Hemingway was just a writer. In the 1920s, if baseball had Ruth, bourbon had Remus. But this King George didn't reside in England. He was a son of Cincinnati. Starting as an apothecary, he soon found a loophole or two in the Volstead Act to craft bourbon for medicinal purposes. Knowing a great opportunity when he saw it, and a great bourbon when he created it, he began his Prohibition Empire. And while he respected the Volstead Act, to King George, it was but a mere suggestion. Carefully crafted in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, just miles from Cincinnati where George Remus ran his Prohibition Empire, each bourbon we make, we make in his honor. After all, King George held uncompromising standards, demanding only two things from his circle of trusted workers. A mash bill to his exact specifications, and of course, the ability to keep a secret. But when you craft a bourbon this good, a secret can be a hard thing to keep. It is a high-rise straight bourbon, the mash bill for which is unfortunately undisclosed. Mm. Uh, it is 94 proof. It has no age statement, so that means it must be at least four years. The price is 35 MSRP. Nice. <laughs> okay. Smell it on the nose. <laughs> mm. Not getting a lot. I get a definite cherry smell. Yep. I can see that. Mm. But see, when I first smelled it, it just smelled sweet. But then when you when you put cherry in my head, I can see it. I know. So I, don't know, I, know. I don't know if I actually smell cherry or just maybe. I know. That's a problem with that. Oh my God. I smell Zagnut. <laughs> no, I don't. It's good. <laughs> So, <laughs> fuck is a zag nut <laughs> it's like a bastard butter finger from like 1930 <laughs> that's right I, I remember it being a thing but i didn't remember what it, it was. was if a butter finger was stale in your glove compartment for like a month <laughs> it's like a zag nut exactly fucking love butter fingers hated zag nut yeah really for that exact reason though you know what it wasn't bad a clark bar clark, bar. clark bars yeah well, clark that, bars are hit or miss yeah. so sometimes they could be stale too yeah. and if yeah. they're stale they get really chewy Oh, yeah. 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 It's really unfortunate. <laughs> it's unpleasant. Just for the record, this smells like none of them. <laughs> right. Not a Clark bar. No. Not a Zygnut. It's not buttery or anything <laughs> or, like that. No. Or fingery. I don't smell any fingers. <laughs> oh, wait. I just, wait my, I'm smelling my own finger. It's or, really or, or nutty. There's no nut in it. No. What is a zag? No. Uh, I don't want to ask. Mm. Mm. I drank too okay. much. <laughs> Poured it in my mustache. What is the proof on this? The proof is 94. It's really smooth. It is really smooth I for mean, 94. I have to tell you, it went down like a basil Hayden or an Irish whiskey. It was so smooth on the throat. I yeah, when I over poured it into my mouth, uh -huh. it was not harsh at all. And when you do that with any other, well, not any other whiskey, but most other whiskeys, you're going to get that immediate swallow and it's not going to be good. But this was you, quite smooth. I think this is one of the smoothest 90 plus whiskeys I've ever drank. Mm, it, it's very smooth. And let's talk about the flavor is very good. It's very good. And the cherry I smelled on the nose is definitely yeah. in the palate. Vanilla, like a burnt sugar vanilla. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It's not unpleasant, but it's a short finish, which kind of adds to the smoothness of it, I think, because it just kind of like whew, goes right down. Yeah. It doesn't burn and linger and, and keep going. But I'm going to taste some of the water now. So. Yeah, yeah. So I've had this on a globe for about three minutes. Mm. It's um, I actually might be one that I like better neat. You have to let mine sit a little know. bit. I just put a globe in it. I'm going back and forth a minute. There's some spiciness to it. You can definitely taste the high rye part of it. Um, I don't think it's as short as you're saying, but... I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. Because I was drinking the Redemption High Rye Bourbon 105, which has a very, very involved finish. I think that might be hurting my perspective oh, on it. Oh, yeah. The Redemption that we were drinking is a single barrel cask, not cask drink, but it's 105. 105. So it's, yeah. it has a really distinctive and full finish. Mm -hmm. well, well, this is a very good finish. But, but, I, but I agree with you that it's not overly long. The George Remus is just a kind of a different approach to the finish. It's not no finish. It's not like you're drinking a $20 whiskey and it drops off a cliff. It's funny. So these are two different high rye bourbons from the same company, from MGP, right. but they taste completely different. The Redemption is more uh, honey, uh, lighter lighter fruit notes, where comparing them, God, that cherry really freaking comes in right. with the George Remus. Um, and there's some spiciness to it, maybe a little bit of baking spices. Yeah. You know, like the I.W. Harper that we did on the last one, this is very easy drinking. I like yeah. this better than the I.W. Harper. Absolutely. Um, the I.W. Harper was what, 82. 82, so it's even lower proof than this. But we remarked about how smooth that was as well. Right. Um, the notes that I have from Whiskey Wash... So on the nose, brown sugar, cherry, ripe summer berries, and aged wood. I think I can see the brown sugar. 
now that it's been mentioned. Uh, I guess the berries could be mixed in with the cherry and stuff, but I don't really get much aged wood on the nose or the palate or the finish. And he has oak or wood on all of these. On the palate, they have um, cherry pie, vanilla, cinnamon, nutmeg, and oak. Again, with the oak. Mm -hmm. And the finish says long and lingering, which we were not experiencing. Rye spice, oak, and leather. Mm, Sounds like me in the sack, you know, long and lingering. There you go, ladies. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Jesus. Crickets. (laughs) Knew they were coming. Yeah, definite crickets (laughs) on that one. Maybe another crickets right now. Come on, it's too much. (laughs) That's what she said. To me, not to you. Anyway. Well, you try having whiskey dick 22 <laughs> hours out of the day and see how you do. <laughs> oh, shit. They are, there are uh, limited releases of this. There's a Remus Repeal Reserve 1, 2, 3, and 4, mm-hmm. which they release every year, mm-hmm. uh, I guess, since 2016. Well, 2017, mm-hmm. 2018, 2019, and 2020. The one that, that just came out, these are all high rye straight bourbon blends right. and they give you the mash bills and this one's a two sometimes there's three not only do they give you the mash bills they also give you the proportion of the mash bills okay. so 77 percent of it is a 21 percent rye bourbon and the other 23 percent of it is a 36 percent rye bourbon right uh the age of this one is 12 years uh the proof is 185 dollars msrp that's not crazy for 12 years no uh notes are cinnamon orange zest mint oak almond and maple i would try that I would definitely try that. Uh, They have another limited release that came out in 2019 for the 100th year anniversary of the Volstead Act, Remus Volstead Reserve. (laughs) They only bottled 6,000. Wow. Uh, It is a bottled and bond bourbon. Its mash bill is 75% corn, 21% rye, 4% malted barley. Its proof is also 100, of course. Its age is 14 years, $219 on Drizzly. Drizzly. That drizzly is always high. Well, I couldn't find an MSRP, and then I there's would only 6,000 bottles. I would say that the MSRP would be somewhere between 150 it, and 175 This tasting notes on that are sweet oak and spice, Luxardo cherries, mm-hmm. tobacco, salted caramel, toffee, and toasted pecans. Right. That sounds amazing. No, it does. Anything that MGP wants me to drink, I'm going to drink it. Because <laughs> they, they... They don't have to force you. They make so much whiskey that if they say, hey, guys, this one you should try. I'm like, I'm in line. All righty, then. I'm right there yeah so i think that pretty much sums up what mgp has brought to the table yeah we would not be where we are with whiskey sourcing if it wasn't for their efforts and their vision and their planning and what they've been executing over the last 10 years right and while there might be a little bit of lack of transparency among some whiskey companies it's not really the fault of mgp and we tasted a delicious spirit that they create themselves yes. that they're pretty upfront about even though you know they take the george remus but that's a little bit of marketing and that's fine yeah, it yeah. says on the bottle distilled in indiana we know by now what that means sure it means mgp well, it's their product. I mean, yeah. they, they don't deny it's their product. No. Right. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody for tuning into part two of our whisk commentary on sourcing. Please tune in next week for the final part, part three, when we bring it all together for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Ed. I'm Scott. I'm Gabe. And we're about to drink some more. Be well, everybody. Cheers. Woohoo!